of us are loved. Each of us is welcome. No one is a stranger. No one is an outcast. No one is alone. Everything we do, when our hearts are grateful, and our lives are faithful, makes a better world, one that we can call everybody's home. Good morning. My name is Reverend Denise. My pronouns are she and hers, and I am your interim minister for a few more weeks. I know lots of our friends are at the Pride Parade, and some of you will be joining at the end um, to get there. It has a long route, and that will be lovely. Last year, we had a huge turnout for this service, so we weren't sure what to do. Do we just take the whole service to the Pride Parade? Do we have it here anyway? So we're going to celebrate Pride here. Some of those folks will be watching this service on the YouTube channel later. Um, you might um, notice a friend of mine is here. Fee will be taking a few pictures of me for my portfolio. Don't um, pay them any mind. But Fee also will be substituting um, as story reader for Marta. She's out not feeling well today. so. Reverend Pam will be joining you on August 1st, but won't do any services until September. So we're going into an in-between time. And this week in the E! News, you'll see a list of all the amazing summer services that many of you are going to help do. I think it's an incredible lineup, and um, it's going to be a real treat for you. And um, a reminder to all the people who are leading summer services that tomorrow night we're having a meeting on Zoom to go over some tips and pointers. So I look forward to seeing you there. Queer is not just a gender or a sexuality, but a theology. The language we have for understanding gender and sexuality is often constrained by definitions we make up, culture, and even faith. Queer theology is an emerging way of describing life's mysteries, and you are invited to explore those mysteries today as we talk about different queer theologians, as we queer culture and faith and celebrate Pride Month. Queer is a word that's been reclaimed, and today I hope you learn a bit more about why that word is expansive and more than a sexuality or a gender identity, but also a theology and a philosophy. Chelsea. Some people have asked to join in my last services in different ways, so Chelsea's gonna help in addition to Leslie as worship associates today. Are she, hers. The identities you hold how you want to be called, and the pronouns you choose are respected and welcome here. Always, but especially today, when we are celebrating Pride Month. Good morning. My name is Leslie Pete. My pronouns are she and hers. The chalice lighting is from The Pride Flame by Linda Lee Franson. And there's something for you all to do. When we all are gonna to say together, we light this flame. We light this flame. Thank you. We light this flame. To ignite our hearts and minds, the spark of knowledge that enlightens, the shimmering hope that burns, the blazing love that engulfs our actions, the bonfire of our commitment. We light this flame for those who celebrate themselves, who fear, who hope, who persevere, who stand on the side of love for all. 
we light this flame for those who have been ridiculed, that they may find peace, for those who have fought to marry, that they may celebrate, for those who live in uncertainty in the world, that they may have hope. We light this flame to renew our commitment that no one shall ever again suffer for the right to love. We light this flame to celebrate our kaleidoscope of diversity. Sorry. <clears throat> Sorry, I will start again. We light this flame to celebrate our kaleidoscope of diversity, working, loving, and living on the side of love. For this, we light this flame. Now, could you please rise as you are willing and able to sing hymn number 1053 in the Teal Hymnal. covenant together the words that bind us as a community. We unite in the strength of the bonds of kinship among all persons to promote human dignity and transfer the resources for life's creating, sustaining, and transforming power through worship, study, and service. Please be seated. Yeah. This is my lovely friend, Fee. Hello, everyone. Good morning. I'm Denise's lovely friend, Fee. <laughs> uh, my pronouns are they and them. And I'm going to be reading your story for today. We usually invite the kids up. I don't know if we have it. We're all, bring your inner childs up for it if you can. Why not? Anyone who wants to see the pictures really well, come on up. Yeah. Come watch the story. I'm gonna need the pictures too, because I just got this today, so. <laughs> All right. Our story today is about the journey of a young hero, Julian, with the special aid of a wise woman called Abuela. Or grandmother. Notice moments that you think may require special attention on the part of either Julian or Abuela. Julian, okay, I like that. This is a boy named Julian, and this is his abuela. And those are some mermaids. Julian loves mermaids. Julian loves Julian losing his clothes. Julian in a swirl. Swimming with a big fish. Vamanos, mijo. This is our stop. Hmm. Abuela, did you see the mermaids? This 
that's cute. <laughs> Boyla, did you see the mermaids? I saw the miho. Abuela, I am also a mermaid. I'm going to take a bath. You be good. Julian has a good idea. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> Come here, Miho. For me, Abuela? For you, Julian. Where are we going? You'll see, says Abuela. Mermaids, whispers Julian, Julian, like you, Miho. Let's join them. And they do. Aww. And that's the story. Wow, that was really beautiful. Thank you for having me, Denise. Thank you all for listening to me read. <laughs> I just wanted to add that um, I asked all the kids if they were mermaids, and I got some great answers. Um, some said yes, some said no, some said maybe. Someone said, you never really know. <laughs> so I know that that story was read to you back in 2021 during pandemic, and so you may or may not have remembered it, but I'm sure you won't be surprised that it's one of my very favorite um, stories. And they are going to the Coney Island um, Mermaid Parade. And um, it's a real event, and the costumes are fabulous and fantastic. And um, it's quite an epic, epic thing. So that's why they're taking the subway there. They're going. 
and I just love Grandma's reaction so much. And thank you, Fee, for taking on a story that you'd never seen, but when I found out Marta was ill, I was like, hey, we're driving, you wanna read the story today? <laughs> so, so thank you, so please understand why that was new. So, I'm gonna share a prayer today. The person who wrote it, I met dancing. Um, I, I'm, th there's a little thing I'm known for amongst you, you ministers. I organize the GA dance parties for ministers um, because so often we can't go out in our towns because like we're there with our congregants and this kind of thing. So we usually have a dance party and I've created the tradition that we do silent disco, which I love. So that's where you have headphones on so then everybody can talk to each other, which you use love. They love that. They can control their own volume. They can change the channel and dance to something else. So, so I met Lee Kinev um, at one of the minister dance parties, and they wrote this prayer. And so first I'm going to tell you a story about Lee. And as I read the story, um, ask yourself, am I safe enough to be myself? And do I create spaces where others can be fully themselves? The famous writer, I know a couple of you heard me talking about bell hooks and have been reading bell hooks in her book, All About Love, New Visions. She says, the practice of love offers no place of safety we risk being acted upon by forces outside our control because of the loss, the hurt, the pain that you can be exposed to in love. Think about that. So Lee says, who wrote this, 30 years ago, the, the pink triangle button pinned to my jacket identified me as queer. My t-shirt said, silence equals death and no on nine. An evangelical right-wing group had gotten an initiative on the ballot proposing to amend the Oregon Constitution no ban of LGBTQ plus civil rights and protections and label us abnormal, wrong, unnatural, and perverse. I was already deep in the fight against AIDS and our community was plunged into this dehumanizing, demeaning debate about whether we were dangerous sexual predators, the stakes were high. Can you imagine being labeled that? There was intense homophobia. We were really in fear and in danger as well. It was real. One day I pulled into a gas station where I wasn't really sure I was safe. And I found myself taking off my pink triangle button off my jacket. Although nothing about how I looked didn't signal dyke, I drove away. I was flooded with intense regret for taking off my pin. This was not how I wanted to be in the world. And I believed with all my heart that persistent, obvious queer presence would save us and that I had betrayed my heart. I couldn't shake the feeling. And soon I sewed a pink triangle patch onto my jackets and clothes. Invisibility equals silence. Silence equals death. Decades later, I figured out that I'm trans non-binary. Embracing this has brought tremendous joy and energy and has deepened my authenticity with the world. Using they, them, their pronouns reminds me of that pink triangle patch. And every day I face the question, do I assert, request, correct, hear, now, each time I'm able to answer yes, I experience a teeny sense of nudging up toward life. Now one, of, now, one of our political parties is really busy pushing out waves of bills targeting and oppressing trans and non-binary people and their families through legislatures as well as in our federal government. As a side note, just in 2024, which we're not even half through with, 
Anti-trans bills continue to be introduced across the country, and we track legislation that seeks to block trans people from receiving basic health care, education, legal recognition, and the right to publicly exist. There are 586 bills about this in 42 states. 41 anti-trans bills have passed. 328 are still active and 217 have failed. The stakes are still high all around. And as Jewish author and activist Emma Lazarus taught us back in 1883, and we heard MLK make it famous again, until we are all free, we are, none of us are free. So join me in the spirit of prayer. God of all the names and no names at all, help me live in gratitude for the LGBTQ plus ancestors who paved the road that we all walk on. Stay with me when I'm feeling scared and doing brave, nudging us forward. Amen. The first reading comes from Radical Love, Introduction to Queer Theology by Patrick S. Chang. Eurocentric interpretations of Christianity are rooted in an either or view of the world. This view is quite literally killing LGBTQ people. According to, as Chang says, he goes on to explain that in queer theology, the boundaries between God and me begin to dissolve. My early childhood love for God, which had evaporated in the face of the hatred and intolerance of anti-gay Christians after I realized that I was gay and started to come out of the closet, was rekindled as I understood what it meant to experience embodied love. Those who love one another deeply have passed through the boundaries between death and life. What is queer theology? In fact, this term is best understood as a verb or an action. That is, to queer something is to engage with a methodology that challenges and disrupts the status quo. Talk about God, by and for lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, intersex, questioning people, as well as our allies, over and over again, can simply use the term queer theology as shorthand. Queer theology refers to a way of doing theology that brings down the powerful and lifts up the lowly. This theology seeks to unearth silenced voices or hidden perspectives. In Chang's work, the word queer is used to describe erasing boundaries. Queer theology can be understood as a way of doing theology that is rooted in queer theory and that critiques the binary categories of sexuality, that is, homosexual versus heterosexual, and gender identity, that is, female versus male. Queer theology draws upon scripture, that is the Hebrew and Christian scriptures, in creative ways. Although scripture traditionally has been used as a means of oppressing LGBT people, queer biblical scholars in recent years have not only countered these anti-queer readings with alternative readings, but they have also taken back or reclaimed the Bible by interpreting it positively and constructively from their own perspectives. The liberation stand of queer theologies, theology argues that God was not neutral and in fact had a preferential option for the poor and the oppressed. Our second reading comes to us from Our Lives Matter by queer womanist theologian, Reverend Dr. Pamela Leitze. Dr. Leitze was the first out black lesbian elder in the United Methodist Church and is vice president of academic and student affairs and associate professor of constructive theology at Meadville Lombard Theological School, one of our UU seminaries. What is a womanist? 
A womanist is a black feminist or feminist of color who opposes sexism in the black community and racism throughout the feminist community. According to black American activist and author Alice Walker, the womanist movement unites women of color with the feminist movement. While feminism focuses strictly on gender discrimination, womanism opposes discrimination against women in the areas of race, class, and gender. Queer womanist theology makes the claim that those bodies of LGBTQ persons are important for the tasks of helping to build a peaceable and just world. That happens in relationships. And at the end of the day, eradicating oppression is the heart of queer womanist theological reflection. We must examine not just racism, but sexisms. Not just homophobia, but transphobia. Not just poverty, but war. And not just the fluidity of boundaries, but the homogeny of the status quo. As human beings, we are interconnected, and we really do. I mean, the survival of humanity is dependent upon the well-being of one another. Racism, sexism, homophobia, transphobia are equally discriminatory, and we do a disservice to humanity when we try to parse them out and level them up or subscribe a percentage or, you know, a certain magnitude to one over and against the other. They're all horrible. They're all equally destructive to the human being, to our society, and to our communities. And I think as we're paying attention to one, we're also making invisible the other, you know, until that other demands its attention. You ascribe attention to sexism, then what about racism? You know, so it's a journey. It's not a juggling act, but it's a journey towards giving, giving attention to the fullness of who we are as human beings. All right, that was the academics, you got it? <laughs> Wiggle. Take a deep breath. All right. So, we know that Unitarian Universalism challenges us to work on new ways of thinking, acting, and being, right? And we have a long-term commitment to affirm and celebrate the lives of gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, and queer people, right? We were the first denomination to, to ordain an out gay person, to ordain an out transgender person. We've often been leaders in coming out about our standing up for justice. And I know that since marriage equality passed, there's some people who are like, well, what, what else is there for us to do? We're done, right? And the thing is, in all oppressions, in every oppression out there, there are opportunities every day to stand up and say, I'm not putting up with this injustice. It might be really tiny. And it often is not so blatant. You know, it's easy to say, well, you know, if someone said you can't be gay, I, I'd say something about that. But often, what really happens is that someone who holds marginalized identities just gets picked on a little bit more. They just get criticized a little bit more, right? Or they just don't get certain opportunities a little bit more. Or someone says something and you think, well, it wasn't that bad, so I won't say anything. When all of us, no matter what our identities are, have an opportunity to be posters out there in the world. I'm not gonna say poster children, but posters, billboards out there in the world to say, hey, I'm a safe person. I wanna know if something's happening to you. Or are we really being fair with everyone here to ask questions? Sometimes it's just asking questions, right? Or it's being really out there about what you believe. Queer theology is a newer theology. It's been developing for about 70 years. So 70 is really young when it comes to theology. And we know that some folks who are maybe 60 or older, maybe a little younger than that, 
know queer is a really derogatory word. And some look at one definition of queer as to sully or to spoil. And the word has been reclaimed by the LGBT community. And I really struggled with this word, I will tell you, because I had so many friends who had been made fun of using that word. And at the same time, I knew that my younger LGBT siblings were going, no, this is my word, right? I love this word. And you hear me use this word. So I went on a journey. So you might need a journey too. So don't think that it's you know, just, just certain people. So a way to think of that is that as we expand queer to show us how to get out of a spoiled, obsolete way of thinking and go into something that's expansive, right? Giving attention to the fullness of who we are as human beings. I have a friend who during Pride Month posts like one tip a day and yesterday their tip was um, why is it that you have to wear a pin that says you're an ally? Why not just wear a rainbow, right? Are you really worried that you have to tell everyone, well, here's what I am and I'm not that, right? Right? What would be so horrible? Would it be horrible? What if someone asked you about your button? Hey, tell me about that. That's your opportunity to tell that story. So queer as a theological term is best understood as a verb. It is an action. To queer something is to engage with a methodology that changes and disrupts the status quo which sounds a whole lot like a Unitarian Universalist to me, right? Those, that's, I know there's a part of you that goes, yeah, maybe, right? Growing up, I heard a lot of gay people being made fun of, even though they were friends of our family. Even though my family, you might have said, was more open, they still got made fun of. Someone might say gay, transvestite, dyke, or the horrible F word, fag, right, or cross dresser, with derogatory tones or offensive hand gestures, making fun of people. And sometimes that was followed with a line about, the person was really good, but, you know, they're gay. There was always a but. They couldn't just say, wasn't John amazing? I love what John did with that. Queer was one of the words that wasn't said with love in my home. It taught me not to turn into one of those people. Don't be gay or wear clothes that didn't confirm, conform to a gender marker. And yet I found myself hanging out with the kids who perhaps were the sensitive boys in touch with their feelings or the really strong girls amongst many fabulous kids. Some days I loved fancy dresses, still do, and other days, I wanted to be in Levi's or overalls. Still do. But on those days that I wore those Levi overalls, my grandma might tell me to dress like a proper young lady. As time went on, I was often attracted to girls. I liked some boys, but more girls. And after I dated women, I thought I was phew, done with men. And I was so relieved to just be a lesbian. It seemed so much easier to just claim one word. The confusion about terminology was not just about who I was, but also what to call myself that was accurate and positive. And that was just an ongoing struggle. I finally thought I could stop worrying about that. Life loves to play with you when you think you have it all figured out. In the early 1990s, when I began my LGBT activism, I was often encountered by older folks in the community that were incredibly hurt by that word queer. And while I avoided using the word and our youth embraced it, I really struggled to try to keep everyone happy, right? How, how do I keep everyone happy? I knew I was in love with a woman who later became my wife of more than two decades and calling myself a lesbian seemed correct at the time. And then more and more letters kept getting added to the LGBTQ alphabet. And I thought, oh my God, no one is going to listen to us. By the time we say this whole alphabet, everyone will stop. And you know, I had a PR background too. So I was like, oh, this is getting really, really cumbersome. But I want to honor the path everyone's on. And then they figure out more about themselves. And then they have new names. And I was like, God, what a pain, right? Let's get on to just the rights. I wanted to get on to the rights. 
And later, I was hired to do public relations and fundraising for LGBT causes, and this was an ongoing evolution of names and terminology and what to say. And often I was asked to explain, is queer a bad word? Is queer about gender or sexuality? Why don't you use that word? Why do you use that word? As time went on, queer was more and more a blanket term that meant all the things. And I took the whole alphabet of names and identities and sexualities and genders and I gave, it gave me one word to encompass it all and I kind of liked that. But I also wasn't sure about the ambiguity and the meaning of queer. And then I went to seminary, which probably could be the title of a book I write. And then I went to seminary. In seminary, the word queer was taught not just as a sexuality or a gender, and it didn't mean questioning. Like, nobody says that anymore. That's a pretty well all over, right? Maybe a few people out there, but it's not very popular anymore. It indicated something philosophical and even political sometimes. And I started to take courses in queer theology, and that is when the meaning expanded and opened up my way of thinking and acting and doing that was fundamentally a creative act. To queer something is to expand possibility, to act in love, to be co-creators of possibility. Queering was empowering. Now you might be thinking, I'm not queer, so why or how does this apply to me? That is such a fair question. I see smiles out there, right? You were thinking it, I know, thank you. Our faith calls us to break the bystander effect, to say something, to do something more in the eyes and act of love. What does love look like in the room? Many of us find our spirituality in nature, and if you think about it, nature is about as queer as it gets. Rather than one right tree, there are thousands of trees. Each tree has thousands of leaves, but each leaf is a little bit different. And nature constantly strives for variation. Remember, Reverend Dr. Lightsey's reading reminds us that queer theology works through relationship, not hierarchy. Relationship, just as nature does. Nature changes by being in relationship with other aspects of nature. Queer theology asks us to focus not on one discriminatory practice over another. Instead, we hold that relationships may honor many ways of being, as does nature and honoring the gifts and characteristics of everyone. Everyone. Well, that is how we build relationships between communities. Queering our theology, queering our communities is a journey. It's not compartmentalizing causes, but rather it's an excursion toward giving attention to the fullness of human beings. Remember a couple weeks ago I said, we're really good at at looking at complexity. So thus, how we honor all is important to this interconnected system. This is how we will show that racism, sexism, homophobia, transphobia are all equally discriminatory and interconnected. I would even go on to say that queering something is a battle against fascism. Queering something means to eliminate false binaries Really, is anything all good or all evil? All light or all dark? All black or white? All Christian or Jewish? Straight or gay? Transgender or queer? Those concepts could almost be thought of as self-righteous and sure of themselves, and there is no room for them to have both and. There's no room for them to have complexity. And these contrasting definitions show the world as a place with defined borders edges that you can fall off of. When you were first taught to read a map, didn't you think there would be like a big line that would show you the demarcation between a town or a state? Think of queer as that space when you're at the water's edge. Where is the edge of lake or ocean and land? 
it keeps moving. Queering is the antithesis of how we have been taught to see this world and this culture. And at this point in my life, I'm middle-aged, I no longer see things as just so darn simple to put into categories. Is it wrong to steal? What if you stole to feed your hungry family? Never is this clearer to me than when I do chaplaincy, like when I was at Planned Parenthood. Here I thought it was going to be all like pro-choice and and pro-life. I thought that was it. What a fool I was, right? There were so many complexities brought into that clinic. People who didn't want to have abortions and needed them. People who, who wanted to be pregnant and then it wasn't going right. You know, these lines in life of hard issues rarely are just so black and white. So we now know that we talk about it here all the time, that so often we are looking at healthcare systems that that operate on profit or political systems anchored in oppression. People try to scare us, use fear to incite lack of respect for families or scientists or women or indigenous people or black or brown people. And then there's all the ways that the voting system is rooted in power over patriarchy. If we really wanted everyone to vote, right, we'd make it super easy. Right? But we don't do that. If we wanted everyone to have health care, we would prioritize that, but we don't do that. So I see this as queering is a way to respect humans. Whether I'm listening to patients or congregants, or debating about what is the right path with people, I know that no one oppression is more important than another, but that they're all linked together. Most solutions to things are pretty complex. It's not one answer. So queering requires the spiritual maturity to look at things in a complex manner and taking in all kinds of factors. And now I've fallen in love with this word. Queer theology points out that limiting ourselves to categories of gender or sexuality or philosophy or justice requires expansive thought in the alphabet of LGBTQIA categories. Right? For example, Dr. Leitze says in one of her parts of her book, a biological female might be attracted to a biological male only because the male's gender performance is feminine. And that attraction of this biological female that they have for a biological male thus falls under the same gender-loving construct as queer, eh? The definition of queer expanded, and so did my expression of myself. And naming and identifying myself as queer felt more true more true to my heart. Friends that are not defined by gender or sexuality that I make, but defined instead by their heart and values, that aligns with my faith. I look for people to hang out with that have values in common with me for ways to include more. Some people ask my fiance, Reverend Matt, what's it like to be in relationship with a queer woman? And he reminds them that we are in a queer relationship. Even though it might appear to others to conform to heteronormativity, it is not, I assure you. My identity is tied to my heart and soul and not defined by the gender expression or sexuality of the person I partner with. And when I hear Unitarian Universalists talk about oppressions like anti-racism, I hear them asking us to act in new ways of thinking and doing. That is what queering is. It's applying a new way of thinking becoming anti-racist or anti-oppressionist, we might say, is to queer our thinking around white culture or oppressive culture. So I'm inviting you behind the curtain today to understand queer culture in a manner that extends beyond gender and sexuality as a way of looking at every problem with both and, with new eyes, with paths out of the traditional binary ways. Those paths really haven't given us the answers we needed or we wouldn't be in this state of the world. Queer is available to everybody. Theology is studying the mysterious and the studies of ways in which we think about faith. So theology sermons challenge our intellectual side and then look at all we can do to take in all manner of life and our communities and use it. 
So as Unitarian Universalists, I wonder how queer theology frameworks can help us work at loving. Would queering our faith help to release ourselves from white supremacy culture or culture that focuses on concepts like now, fastest, best, right, wrong, and other absolute descriptions that we might be able to queer and helping us to explore other possibilities rather than absolute perfectionism? A UU religious educator and co-author of the Transforming Hearts curriculum, which is going to be offered here at CCUU next year, Alex Capitan says, Queering faith means turning social conventions upside down. I know you like to do that. Reverend Dr. Leitze says, guided by fear of sexuality, the ultimate human existential, ex existential unknown condition, we dig deep into our positions and refuse to simply say, I don't know. But admitting what we don't know will free us to work with what we do know or to ask questions and be curious. Because what we don't fully understand about human sexuality, what can we do with what we do know? We could begin by loving ourselves, which is a big part I heard when we taught the Article 2 class that people really wanted to embrace with love at the center was about loving yourself first. So this isn't something to learn and master and achieve and check off, but something to practice. Give it a try. Practicing is like being an artist of possibility and I want you to paint. Maybe we'll find ways that are not blue or yellow, but are green instead. So let's paint together. Let us be artists of possibility. Let us queer the world in ways of loving. And if you're thinking to yourself, this all sounds a little ambiguous, you're correct. Ambiguity is what makes Unitarian Universalism a queer theology. And let us use this queering of our faith to find ways to act out injustice, to be anti-oppressionist, anti-racist, to create peace and love up our people. Amen. Giving thanks is an important part of living in a covenantal, self-supporting community. Your financial gifts show gratitude for how our congregation supports us all. We are wildly grateful for you and for this support. Without you, our mission to spread this faith of love could not evolve. Your gifts of gratitude and love will now gratefully be received.
are gentle, angry people, and we are singing, singing for our lives. We are a gentle, angry people, and we are singing, singing for our lives. We are gay and straight together, and we are singing. Blessed are the wanderers seeking affirmation. Blessed are the worshipers praying from closets, pulpits, pews, and hardship. Blessed are the lovers of leaving, leaving family and familiarity, leaving tables where love is not being served. Blessed are those who stay. Blessed are those who hunger for thirst and justice, for they will be satisfied. And blessed are the queer, disciples of truth, living, breathing, sacred reflections of divine love. Go in peace, my friends. That are the queer, for one way or another, Everybody wonders, am I welcome here? Love has saved a seat, a seat before the table, waiting for the great fall, laden with a bee. Cast away your fear, hear if you can hear, blessed are the queer. Blessed are we all, no matter love or gender, joyfully together, answering the call. that we've become, we offer to our neighbors, once we all were strangers, now we have a home, where our hearts are whole, where we are consoled, blessed are we all. Stay connected.